So I want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, some of you come from far away, some from here. Uh, and I want to thank Elliot Bay for our hosting, and of course, uh, the lovely Gavin Kovai, who will be turning letters for us. And so war porn is, uh, it's structured in three main sections. It's kind of built like a, like a Russian nesting dolls. So there's the inner kernel, and then there's an outer section, and then there's uh, the outer outer section. And so we start and end with a uh, barbecue with some 20-somethings in, in Utah. And one of them brings to the barbecue a, a friend of hers who just got back from Iraq. Um, and, and things sort of go, go sour from there. Uh, the, the middle section is about an American soldier in Baghdad, 2003 to 2004, a Humvee driver named Wilson. And then the very kernel, the core of the novel, is about an Iraqi mathematician named Qasim. Uh, the sections interweave and interconnect in different ways, mainly through Qasim, who appears in all three sections in different, in different guises. Uh, and they're also held together with uh, what I call Babylon sections, which are uh, these sort of almost prose poetry stream of collective conscious uh, sort of um, bits that uh, bring together language from different sources, uh, from military manuals and uh, news reports and uh, different things, and sort of spin it all together. Uh, I tell you all this in order to give you a sense of the shape of the book, and also because I'm going to read from, briefly from three different sections tonight. First from the Iraqi section, from the section about Qasim, although he, he only shows up briefly. Uh, and then a section, one of the Babylon sections that's more language-based, and then finally uh, I'll read from uh, the Wilson section, uh, the American soldier in Baghdad. Day and night, bombs crashed into Baghdad. You watched it on TV, you heard it on the radio, you saw it from the roof and when you ventured out into the street. Soldiers and civilians, arms and legs roasting, broken by falling stone, intestines spilling onto concrete, homes and barracks, walls ripped open, Baathists and Islamists, communists and social democrats, grocers, tailors, construction workers, nurses, teachers, all scurrying to hide in dim burrows where they would wait to die as many died, some slowly from disease and infection, others quick in bursts of light, thickets of tumbling steel, halos of dust crushed by the world's greatest army. As the bombing grew worse, the terror of it stained every living moment. Sleep was a fractured nightmare of the day before, cut short by another raid. Stillness and quiet didn't mean peace, only more hours of anxious waiting or death. Even the comfort of family rubbed raw. Maha sat in her room listening to Britney Spears and Brandy, wishing she was anywhere else. This war was going to ruin her life, she knew it. It was going to ruin her chances for marriage, it was going to ruin everything. Her skin was breaking out, her hair frizzing and splitting. She stood at her window and gazed through the slit between the two pieces of plywood nailed over the glass and watched smoke drift over her city, and the smoke was her future fading to haze. She started hitting Nazaha hard. She hated how her sister kept praying, stupid praying to stupid God, like it would do anything. She hated her mother and father, her sick cousin Qasim, whom she had to keep nursing, creepy old Othman, her sisters. She hated her mother's patience and stillness. She hated Warda's incessant singing and Kalita's watchful eyes. They were all conspiring against her. None of them understood how terrible it was to have her life ruined at 17, before she was married, before she'd even fallen in love. She stood at her window and gazed through the slit between the two pieces of wood and watched flames burn along the skyline, half hoping she'd see it all devour. And more bombs fell on the city. Bread prices doubled, tripled, quadrupled. There was no propane. There was no benzene. The satellite went in and out, and eventually Iraq TV shut down. But the radio still played patriotic songs and reports of the Americans' defeat. When they could, they watched CNN or Al Jazeera. They watched balls of fire rise up in the night across the Dijla, red and gold flowers blooming in the black water. They saw their city in green from above, and videos made by the men who were killing them Bright neon stripes cutting the screen, pale green explosions below. They watched TV reporters in Kuwait, Qatar, and Israel put on gas masks. They watched American tanks push across the desert. They watched Iraqi soldiers surrender. They watched Iraqi soldiers die. 
They watched their brothers and husbands and sons forced to their knees and thrown like trash into the backs of trucks, blindfolded and hogtied. On Al Jazeera, they saw children in rubble, ruptured bodies leaking like cracked pomegranates. On CNN, they saw generals pointing at big maps full of arrows. Allahu Akbar, cried the Moazin, la ilaha illallah, and more bombs fell. Nazaha prayed. She bore the abuse of her sister, the discomforts when there was no light, no electricity or no water. She bore the tremor of fear. She bore it all, praying constantly to God and the Prophet, to Khadijah, the Prophet's wife, to Fatima, the Prophet's daughter, and to Michael Jackson. God was testing them, just as he tested the Prophet, and she would show him her heart's recitation. So devout in her prayer was she that her absent-mindedness grew worse than ever. She let the kettle boil over. She burned bread. She forgot to give Qasim his antibiotic. She swept up the kitchen and left a small, tidy pile of dirt in the middle of the floor. Her mother chided her. Kalita snapped at her. Maha hit her. And Azaha prayed for forgiveness and mercy. She prayed to be less absent-minded. She prayed for God to make her eyebrows less bushy. She prayed for God to keep them all safe. It was hard with all the fear in the house to feel the nearness of God. More and more, she spent her time alone writing out prayers on slips of paper, reading the Quran and books on the Sira and the Hadith, and a book from the 70s about pan-Islamism. She drew secret pictures of the Prophet and Michael Jackson riding together on Barak, the white-winged, woman-faced horse that carried the Prophet on the Isra and Mirage. She pictured the Prophet and Michael Jackson walking together in the desert, holding hands, Fatima looking suspiciously like Nazaha herself, walking behind them. She imagined they spoke together of the jagged beauty of palm trees and the buzz of bees, the way honey dripped clear and gold on flatbread, her father's smell when he'd been smoking, and of how the purity of God's mercy would conquer all, how great God was to have given us such a world, with red tomatoes and green reeds and the great brown dijla, the wonder of the Moazine's call and the glory of thriller, the perfection of breakfast at breakfast time, tea at tea time, and bed at bedtime. Nazaha prayed in ecstasies of gratitude that she was alive and that God had made the world and that the world was so perfect and full. And more bombs fell. The lights went out. The electricity went out. The water stopped running. It came back on. It shut off again. They began to leave candles everywhere and matches. They went to bed just after sundown, even though they knew they wouldn't sleep through the night, and arose at dawn, lethargic and anxious from the night's thundering bombardments. There was nothing else to do with the power off and on, but lie in their misery and fear. Allahu Akbar, cried the Muazin, La ilaha illallah. Day and night, bombs, rockets, and missiles crashed down into Baghdad, erupting in plumes of smoke, strewing metal and the screaming wounded. And they watched CNN, Al Jazeera, and the BBC. And they saw their city burning. They watched their husbands, sons, and brothers shot, captured, shamed, dishonored. They watched Umkazar fall. They watched Basra fall. They watched Al Nasiriya fall. They watched Karbala fall. They huddled around a map listening to the rumors on the news, trying to see how far the Americans had come. Nothing is over. This is the story of a half-crazed, long-haired Vietnam vet harassed by small-town lawmen lost on his one-man mission of vengeance. Back in the war, he was part of a ragtag team of misfit soldiers, hand-picked for a suicide mission to kill Hitler. Good and evil. He's a downed fighter pilot. He's red and white and blue. This is the story of the sword, gun, Dawn patrols, black tops sit guided in a bad hundred feet drowned gulf. Military units added to the brass shell dogs devour battle. So they too were made of vanity and 72 hours not from the stories of previous wars. Violence inflicted on the largest burden themselves, some of which depicted pyramids and the rest shocked of no man's land. Lee Marvin leads a ragtag gang of misfits through the hell of war and loss of innocence as they fight for freedom in America from the deserts of North Africa to the forests of Germany. He's an idealistic young officer leading his all-black regiment on a suicide attack in a coastal fortress. No man. Through me, tell the story of one man's rage and the raising of an ancient city. He's an idealistic young officer charged with cowardice for refusing to send his men to their death on a suicide attack. New reports. Electricity. Widening the circle of direct blame for shooting it at my ass. On first setting eyes, alas, my son, harassed by small-town artillery emplacements, a bridge no more. Night and day did I glory in misfits, hand-picked and leads a ragtag bunch of strength to all in Troy, both men and hell, from the glory. 
A young man discovers commando wore nothing, for no one pilot develops a tenuous ragtag bunch of all-American right hand like the lizard, but that's not hell. A bunch of ragtag boots lying like getting my machine impression of his wife, the blow, I mean, when I voted for hell. Horses in administrative succession, running the Achaeans, divide the fate, detainee sevens, allegations, a tale of courage and honor, loyalty, grace under pressure, and the will to win. He's a young, dedicated soldier sent up the river to kill a rogue agent. He's a drunk, grizzled vet sergeant fighting bureaucratic bullshit to transform a ragtag bunch of misfits into a steely band of killers, leading them to glory in the assault on Granada. The allegations of this man alone, unsupported, allegations of abuse, his statements available, Peleus, for he is mightier than you. Nevertheless, intel interests dogs and vultures, and a load of grief would be lifted from my damage, Iraq's eyewitness reports, life, both Iraqis cried, the British Academy has committed Muslims, like people attacking a library. Ragtag, a young glory. An Army Special Forces operative goes up the river. A young man joins the Marines and becomes a photographer and is sent to Vietnam and learns that war is hell is hell. War story. A retired Special Forces operative returns to Vietnam to rescue his POW buddies. This is the story of the center in Washington, D.C., where he practiced for conventions of war or rules, had no way to confirm they were the war near equipment in civilian areas, maintaining Abu Ghraib largely with Iraqis of no intelligence, a lot firmer, particularly his own military, a final atrocity exploited for detainees were meant to be exploited for. Many shops, no coalition forces, prisoners scooped up in this way soon, flooded the keepers, taken all the campaign on the harsh terrain of disadvantages, nighttime sweeps gave Saddam 48 hours on the harsh terrain of detainees at Abu Ghraib, whomsoever, Allah, overcrowding difficulties, the Iraqi Academy of Physical Abuse while stuck here. This is the story of we happy stuck here. This is the story of a ragtag bunch of misfits picked for a suicide mission to stuck here. A young man from the ragtag clutches, a noble professional special forces commando learns that war is young. A young hell and ragtag bunch of all-American misfits fight Japs in the South Pacific and learn war is war. A bunch of ragtag of young ragtag learn the true meaning of discipline and camaraderie and war and war. A young maverick risks everything to save his father from the Libyans. A ragtag bunch of Australians go halfway across the world and learn war is his. This is the story, ragtag young man. Stuck here. Stuck here. This is the story of valor, duty, and the cost of war. A young camaraderie. This is the story of a young man who learns war always has a cost. A young wacky. This is the story of a wacky bunch of ragtag misfits trying to escape from Nazi prison. A wacky bunch of ragtag misfits running an army hospital in Korea. A ragtag, maverick, valor war. This is the story of a young man's war, the story of We Happy Few. Whenever possible, you should avoid kill zones such as streets, alleys, and parks. Driving the edge of Sadr City through bumper to bumper afternoon jam, I heard Lieutenant Krauss behind me yell, Weapon on the left. What? Where? the BC shouted. Pistol. Pistol left side, blue shirt, pistol left. Captain Yarrow grabbed the hand mic and I looked left, taking the scene at a glance. First, it was a mass of bodies on a corner, then I picked out two people arguing. A blue shirt, a pistol. Captain Yarrow said something into the mic and Lieutenant Krauss shouted, He's aiming, he's aiming. Then two loud bangs behind my head. Brass dinged off my Kevlar and fell burning down the back of my shirt. In my periphery, movement. Iraqis scattered and dove to the ground. There he goes, shouted Kraus, and fired two more times. I scrunched my head into my shoulders like a turtle, closing the gap between my helmet and armor. His empty shells plinked off me. More shooting, ours, into the crowd. Across the street, I saw a woman in black jerk up and swing to the ground. Cease fire, cease fire, Captain Yarrow shouted. Keep driving, keep driving. Our windows wide, we sucked down exhaust, refinery smoke, propane, and the reek of sun-baked sewage. Crowds in traffic, buildings looming, cars in stucco, and we come up out of the mess onto the expressway, flow at a dead stop. Honking cars clogged the lanes, bumpers scraping fenders, brown faces glaring. Up ahead, we could see American soldiers blocking the road, gun trucks and air guards, some big army guilt fog. IED? Didn't hear anything. Maybe it hasn't gone off. Could be a checkpoint. I think it's an IED. Ahead on the left, Iraqis cut through a gap in the guardrail where a tank had rolled through. We moved slowly forward, filling the space opened by the fleeing cars. If it was a checkpoint, we'd be moving. 
An Iraqi car started backing toward us, angling for the gap, and I laid on the horn. The driver stuck his hat out of his window and pointed where he wanted to go. I flipped him off and goosed forward, ramming his rear. His hands flew up in anger. Good job, Wilson. You want me to go for that gap, sir? No, we'll wait it out. Twenty-five minutes later, boiling between the sun and the engine, I asked him again about the gap, and he said yes. We edged over, nudging Iraqi cars out of the way with the brush guard, then swung around and took off back the way we came. Captain Yarrow scanned the thick red and blue lines on a street map of Baghdad. He gave me directions across the 3 ID bridge and into the green zone, but we got lost and wound up driving down a quiet, tree-lined boulevard along the Tigris. We passed the building spray-painted Iraqi Communist Workers' Party and eluded bank. Iraqis ambled along like it was interday Linden, couples holding hands, businessmen talking, heads bowed like mendicants. The smell of the trees cut the stink of exhaust, and in the dappled shade it seemed we'd fallen through a rabbit hole into some alternate Baghdad, an oasis of brotherhood and peace. Then we came up, came up on a bridge and into the burning sky. Refinery fires licked the horizon. A couple days later was the 4th of July, and to celebrate they had a barbecue at the DFAC, hamburgers and hot dogs, a Star Wars marathon, and the compound's decrepit movie theater. After dinner, as the sun went down, Heels and I and some other guys went up on the roof of our building and smoked. The upper six floors were off limits because of snipers. The first few times we went cautiously for souvenirs. Someone found a framed photo of Saddam. I got a Haji calendar and a picture of some guy getting an award. We also found what the Marines had left, a pile of half-eaten MREs and graffiti. Fuck Iraq and first to fight. Now we went up to watch the city. Sweeping cloverleaf interchanges, satellite dishes, pile-ups and traffic, six million souls watching DVDs and blogging, texting each other, hurrying through markets past sheep carcasses hung to bleed, spice cellars, bags of black dried limes and reef baskets, and old women haggling over okra, children running between stalls and down alleys, and faces flickering in brass. Up out of the ancient garden of Sinbad's ba Baghdad in the nightmare, of Saddam's Ba'athist dystopia through the fiber-optic slums of Tomorrowland, where shepherds on cell phones herded flocks down expressways and insurgents vi uploaded video beheadings. Everything rising and falling is one. Hammurabi's code and Xboxes, the wheel and the web, Ur to Persepolis to sykes Pico to CNN, a ruin outside of time, the 21st century cyberpunk war machine interzone. We watched cars zoom by below while Kaya was wickered overhead. An RPG went off in the distance, yellow sparks shrieking up at the helicopter, ceaselessly circling, and we cheered. Tracers rose and fell across the sky like burning neon. I can't believe how much this place looks like L.A., Burnett said. Foster flicked a butt over the side. You up here last night? No. Nah. Wicked firefight. The sun bled magenta across the horizon, and the lights on the shops and cafes carved tiny scallops in the purple night. Cars without headlights flew down the road, weaving crazily. No traffic lights, no cops, no street lamps. We waited for collisions, explosions, gunshots. This stupid fucking place, Burnett said. I don't know why we don't just nuke it. What, Burnett? You want to miss this? This is your war, man. Yeah, I want it to be interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. Shut your fucking face, pal, you sick piece of shit. You do not deserve to survive in my core. You ever notice Bullwinkle looks like Pyle? You better watch out, he might shoot you in your underwear. You better f***ing kill me if he thinks you can take my underwear. Come on, Burnett. I know you're a secret Haji lover. You blow your wad every night, dreaming of some fat-ass Haji bitch riding your cock off. La -la 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 -la. See that bitch today in the blue jeans? S*** hot. Just like a f***ing American girl. Ass cheeks like melons. Honeydew melons. That's what I'm talking about. Some sweet Haji ass. F*** that. Haji stink. S*** They wash up like normal people. Besides, you stink too. Yeah, but I ain't gonna f*** me. Unless you get some Haji talk, that's the only thing that's fucking you. You just let yourself go for a few weeks until you're really filthy. Then you won't even notice. Negative. They're probably fucking diseased or some shit. Catch some freaky Muhammad clap. The black syphilis. Hell yeah. They got diseases here you ain't even heard of. I heard the PA say watch out for leishmaniasis. What the fuck's that? We should've just fucking nuked this fucking fucked up fuck hole from the fucking start. Then we come back and take the oil whenever we want. There was a flash in the distance. Oh shit, see that? Looked like an IED. 
An Apache swung low over the gray cloud rising where the flash had gone off. We lit cigarettes as the last of the light faded, watching the Apache dip and swing like a giant angry wasp. So I just listen to this? Do you have, do you have more? No, nah, man, go for it. All right, so, hey, I'm Gavin <laughs> Kovite. Um, we know each other for, uh, for, for a few years now. Um, I'll make a few brief statements and then ask a question, and then if you're okay with this, just go back and forth, you know, like, audience question. Do, do it how you like. All right. Yeah. So, hey, so um, Roy and I met at a, uh, the NYU Veterans Writing Program, which is like a, kind of what it sounds like. It was at NYU. Um, and it was this weird little sort of writing program, free for veterans. It was like advertised yeah. on Craigslist or something. How did you find out about it? Uh, I, I, was, got, I got an email. Okay. I was going to NYU. School. Yeah. Okay, I was going to NYU Law at the time. So I think I saw something on the the NYU bulletin board. He's going to the New School. Um, so we met at the, in this like, weird little building, right? And I, I figured it was going to be like you know a bunch of people doing some really bad writing. Uh, it's going to be kind of embarrassingly therapeutic, but I'd meet some veterans because I didn't know any veterans. Did you know any veterans at the time when you go into zero? Zero. Yeah. We'll talk about this later, which yeah. is super interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway, we met a few people, but it turned out after a while we kind of realized that among these people were some really good writers. So among these people, I don't know if you guys, how familiar you guys, you guys are with this sort of micro canon of like Iraq and Afghanistan GWAT literature, but it's like... Myself and, and Roy, you have two books now. Yeah. I've got a book. We're both in the short story collection. But Phil Cly, who won the National Book Award for Redeployment, yeah. was there. Yeah. Matt Gallagher, Matt Gallagher wrote, wrote a couple books. Yeah, yeah. Terry O'Brien has O'Brien. a book out now. Yeah. He's, Maurice Ducall, who's in yeah. like these plays now in New York City. Jake, who's uh, Jake Siegel. still working on a book, but he's been writing for the Daily Post. Right. Journalists. It's like it's weird. Yeah. It's like there's like eight or plus books yeah. that came out of this stupid little writing circle. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe I don't have too much to say about that, but I will say this. Generally, all of these books, right, so for a while, like in 2005 or six or something, people were saying that the intelligentsia were saying things like, oh, where's the, where's the literature now for these, from these, like, you know, New Yorks? Um, and then some literature started coming out. Um, what almost all the literature had in common is that it was written exclusively pretty much from an American soldier's or Marines or whatever, I'll just say soldiers' viewpoint, um, and that it was broadly sympathetic to the to the American soldier, right? Yeah, you know, people do bad things in war, and it sucks, and you get confused or whatever, and it's traumatic and stuff, but, but basically, the soldier is, is the hero, the sympathetic hero, and you see it through his, generally his eyes. This book is different. I would say for two reasons, right? One, as, as Roy has, has read to you, a big chunk of the book, or at least a, a you know, a, a substantial chunk of the book is written from the point of view of an Iraqi, uh, Qasim, this yeah. professor. And the soldiers are not sympathetic. They're really not. Um, which is, and it's interesting. And, and they're interestingly unsympathetic. Unsympathetic in, in a way that I think is very real, um, that a lot of soldiers will recognize. Um, unsympathetic, in my mind, sometimes that is over the top in a way that I think, though, has... Meaning and like there, there's a reason behind that. So with that, uh, I'm gonna ask the first question, which is, what's up with that man? Like, <laughs> what's up with the unsympathetic characters and with putting that point of view from the Iraqi point of from the Iraqi eyes? Yeah. Well, so great. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. I, uh, it, so when I when I started, I started writing this uh, book in 2005. Actually, I was still in the army. Um, and I knew from the beginning, like, I grew up reading war novels. I grew up watching war movies. Uh, it was just something I, I imbibed. Um, and, but, and I knew when I started writing this that I wanted to do something different than the, like, I went to war and war is hell kind of story. As, as you know, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I mean, there, there's some things maybe wrong with that. We can talk about that in a deeper level. I've written about that critically. So we can talk about what's wrong with that kind of story, depending on the war, whatever. But like, I knew I didn't want to write that. I wanted to figure out some other way to talk about the war, some other narrative frame. And so what I came up with was this sort of 
basically tripartite structure. It's like before the war, during the war, and after the war, temporally. Um, and then like situationally, like Iraqi American soldier and home front, right? Um, the actual like sort of Russian nesting doll structure didn't happen until till much later, but I knew they had to have these three different pieces. So that's that's sort of the motivation behind the Iraqi section. And, and why why the unsympathetic soldiers? Well, so I guess two things. One is that I I was drawing on what I felt like was, was this tradition of literature of the messed up soldier. Uh, this is in the home front section. So sort of going back to um, you know the the play Wojciech, right, which is about a soldier who murders his wife, um, and and also wanting to address the the incidents and the the fact of of readjustment in terms of uh, in terms of sexual violence, because that that had been you know, when I was in Iraq or 304, that had been such a, a big part of what the war looked like because of Abu Ghraib and uh, all the um, photos that came out in 2004. Um, but in terms of the description of the soldiers, the narrative of the soldiers, like what I just read, I don't, I guess I don't, I don't feel like it's particularly un unsympathetic. Um, I feel like it's not, I, like I'm not trying to make them sound better than they are. Um, and I'm not showing, and I'm not necessarily showing all the, um, all the ways that they're kind, good people. So I guess it is unsympathetic in a certain way. Um, but a lot of, it's, a lot of it is, is portraying a certain kind of callousness. Um, and toward the Iraqis, which is in part just like the jocularity of like 18, 19 year old guys put in a difficult situation, right? Like they're 18, 19 year old guys who are athletic and they're giving each other shit all the time with tough language and stuff that you wouldn't you know, want to read out loud to your family. Um, <laughs> And then you put them in a situation where they feel threatened and they feel like there are all these people around them who they at once they kind of pity and feel and and feel some kind of contempt for. And then once you start taking rounds, like you're 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 afraid of them, you hate them. And so it, it turns into this very complicated dynamic, I think, that that really I don't know, it makes I it seemed to make people very callous. And so part of the effort was to to portray that. I mean, I don't, yeah, so. Okay, I mean, that's, I mean, right, that's, that's the answer, yeah. right. And I think, and there's a bunch of other threads that, that were opened up there. Yeah. At this point, though, does anybody have a, a burning question to, to ask? Yeah, I'm just curious, when you were in Iraq, were you callous? You know, did you, were you affected by the, you know, I uh, also, when you go through boot camp, it's, you know, I know it, uh, I had a friend that was in Vietnam, uh -huh. went to boot camp. Of course, I was in the anti-war movement, but uh, I don't know how he, why he joined, but he did. And he comes back and he just says, I want to kill gooks. I wanna, we're all sitting, all my buds were all sitting there in my bedroom, and he's just going on and on. I want to kill gooks, I want to kill gooks. So, you know, this, this term, haji and stuff, yeah. did you get that when you were in boot camp? No, we, there were other terms. Commies. There, yeah, there were commies. <laughs> there was sand, uh, ragheads. I think was was used a little bit, but but it wasn't. It was mostly like the sergeants in boot camp were Cold War guys mostly. Um, I mean, yeah, they hadn't. The Haji really only came into use when we were in once we were downrange. Um, yeah. Uh, but I did, I do feel like, 
I mean, I, I did get Kylist and, and a little, a little, and kind of racist over there. Um, and then had to like work that out of my system. Um, this one of the things I'm actually, I try to portray with Wilson is that he's a sensitive guy and he tries to keep his distance from the situation. Like he tries not to let it get to him in certain ways. But as the, as his tour goes on, he just, he, he can't help but fulfill the role that he is obligated to play, right? So as his tour goes on, he becomes more and more, uh, more and more callous and more and more, uh, less and less concerned with preserving that part of himself that he thought was different from who he is. Um, and I think that happens to some people. Can, can I ask, are, are you familiar with the, uh, the research about firing rates in combat by S.L.A. Marshall and Grossman later on? That... Yeah, I've seen some of this stuff about, like, uh, without... I would go ahead and... I mean, I think this is super interesting, yeah. right, and, and relevant, but stop me if this gets unrelevant. Oh. But I think this is relevant. Um, there's been a bunch of research done in, in the 40s, but also like much more recently, um, that shows that the firing rates for people on the front line, meaning like soldiers on the front line being able to see the enemy, right? Only, only like maybe 20% of soldiers actually fired their weapons at the enemy on the front line. And these are people who are exposed to danger. So, for instance, in, in Civil War and Napoleonic era battles, you'd have up to 80% of soldiers on the front line Loading and loading again their muskets until there's like I mean you, you see these they, they find these dead bodies with eight musket balls loaded up because the the human the, the human resistance to firing at another human and killing another human is just that great right it's just so hard to overcome these people are willing to they're willing the, the peer pressure and the social expectations to get on that front line and act like a brave soldier is great enough that it's like more powerful than wanting to live right. But it's not more powerful than not than, than the resistance to killing somebody if you can avoid it somehow. All right, so take that as, as true for now. The the army realized this, I would say, in the 40s and 50s after Marshall, this this brigadier general, had done all this research in, in World War II, um, and said showed the army, hey, like our soldiers are not firing, um, and they did a, a couple a few different things. One is is instead of shooting at bullseyes, now soldiers shoot at pop up human shaped targets. They look like humans, they pop up when you shoot them, they, they go down. Um, but also, in, I'm sure in both of our um, experiences, we do things like run around and say, kill, 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 right? We like bayonet things, kill, and like gooks in the open, and then you, and then you like mow down the human safe targets. And this is all conditioning yeah. that makes us able to kill humans, right? And it's necessary if you're going to have soldiers actually shoot on the front lines, right? Yeah. Okay. And I should, I mean, I shouldn't even say this because I haven't actually done the, the back research on it, but from what I understand, there's some question about those, those numbers, the 20%, 80% stuff. Right, it's there's questions totally about totally reliable, but that's just, I mean, I have, like I said, I haven't done the homework on that. But demonizing the enemy is like, that goes, that goes, that has a long tradition in human culture, maybe because it's just hard to like. It's hard to kill people. It's hard to kill people. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's it's part of, you know, demonizing the enemy is part of how war works, right? It's part of that form of politics. Did we answer that question? Or you, I guess that's yeah. it's your responsibility. Yes. I'm just a guy here. Um, that question is answered. <laughs> Unless you don't. All right, can I, let me, I'm, I'm so interested in one, this is a little bit of a different topic. Um, it's on page 96. Okay. So the character, loosely based on Roy, but not exactly Roy, right, yeah. is in like a UN compound, basically. Yeah. Do you want yeah. to read a paragraph? Do you want me to read this? Is that okay? What do you want me to read? This is one paragraph, and I'll pull it to okay. the end of that paragraph, which okay. I love this paragraph. Right, so this is, uh, this is like in the summer... Uh, they've been running patrols, um, picking up uh, unexploded ordnance all over. And then the captain takes them to the UN compound for lunch. And they're just blown away by like all this, like there's like, fresh food and salad and all this and plates, you know, because they've been eating army food. Uh, 
My mouth full of chicken, I flushed with obscure yearning, loneliness, and the sudden desire for these people, the UN people, to see me as one of their own. To see how enlightened I really was beneath my salt stick DCUs, how different from the thugs I'd come in with. I wanted to talk with these business casual cosmopolitans about human rights and cultural programming, Michelle Foucault and Zadie Smith. I wanted to corner the woman in the skirt, take her hands in mine, and convince her. I used to read Whitman. I used to read Joyce. Okay. <laughs> I love that paragraph. Um, it speaks to me a lot, too. Yeah. Um, and it also speaks to this, to this reality, right, that, um, that the military is profoundly classed. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for this, which we don't have to go into, but, like, at this day and age, right, um, being a soldier in uniform means you're not part of the elite. Yeah. Which is weird. Right. Right? Um, and it also can lead, at least in my case, and certainly in your case, too, to this idea that this feeling that, like, no one understands you, you know, you, you, you're, in this, you're in this uniform, you got a helmet on, and, like, you just look like one of these guys, you know, but really, you're, like, a person, and you, you think you're a thinking man. Now you're a professor at Notre Dame University, right? Yeah. Um, can you talk about that? <laughs> uh, which part? Um, about that, well... Um... I mean, I'll say this here for a prompt, right? Okay. In this paragraph, your not fictional, not real avatar yeah. is saying something to the effect of, like, I wish people would take me seriously as a thinking person, right? And I'm like, I'm not just some drone. Uh, because for sure, like, I've had the experience at least of, like, people sort of assuming, educated people, right? Seattleites, um, assuming <laughs> that soldiers are, tend to be sort of conservative drones or whatever, either either too stupid to know any better or... Or like actually out to like racistly kill people, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, there's this kind of like desire for like, no, like I'm I'm smart. Like I read I read Joyce and shit, you know? Right. It's clear now that you read Joyce. You got a right. PhD and you're a professor, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, what are your experiences with sort of like dealing with that sort of social stuff, like that, you know, the kind of social reality of you being both a veteran, right, but also this elite intellectual, which you now are, right? Yeah, no, I used to hear a lot, especially uh, right after I got out of the Army, that uh, people were surprised that I had been in the Army. Um, maybe, How did that make you maybe feel? Maybe because of my funny, <laughs> maybe because of my fancy glasses or something. It's, it's, it's weird. I mean, you know, people just like, I, I mean, this is part of the point of the book and part of why it's called War Porn and part of um, a lot of the writing that I've done since I got out of the Army is that like, we have these ideas, we have these fantasies of what a soldier is supposed to be in and for American culture. Like, it, it, the soldier occupies this kind of special place that's at once degraded, like soldiers are dumb and they're racist and they're southern and they're whatever, and they're like noble and hardworking and honest and boy scouts, and like there's, it's, and they're not. They're like, soldiers are people, um, many from military families, many not, uh, from a wide range of places, especially once you include the National Guard. Um, I mean, and so there's that whole issue of, of the way the soldier occupies a special role in the American imaginary that's complicated, um, and how, you know, one may feel like one does or doesn't fit that role. Um, Part of the thing I was trying to get at with that section with Wilson was the weird bubble that the UN compound seemed to seemed to be, which was like this. You, we went inside. Uh, Wilson went inside, and it's air conditioned, and there's, there's people in suits, and it's like you're in an office in New York or something. It's just very international, and everybody's got their files and their computers. Um, you know, later that summer it was blown up by a truck bomb. But like at that moment, it really seemed like this special protected place where you know people did white collar work, and it was like this special, this special place of of the mind, right? And for Wilson, that connected back to him, you know, before joining the military, being a poet and a writer, and and this sort of this sense of disconnection this longing, this feeling trapped in 
his body as a soldier in Iraq, having to do, having to run Iraqis off the road and do all this stuff. Um, yeah, I, so there's this, there's this separation. He's separated from these UN people, um, wanting to be recognized by them, unable to, to access that. Um, and I think part two of what I was trying to get at there was just the weird, the weird discrepancy and disconnection between these different levels of international engagement in Baghdad and like and what that had to do with what, if anything. Like, I don't know, it just um, I mean you were in the green zone, so you probably felt like a weird other weird disconnections, but like it just it was it was very strange. You drive around Baghdad you, you know, at that point Right after the invasion, the city was a complete mess, and yet here's this like little bastion of like Western uh, diplomatic liberalism and internationalism. You know, it's the UN right there. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm being articulate. Like I had to write it in the scene because there's so many things going on there. So I felt like I had to try to portray something of the Iraqi point of view, um, you know, it, it, at whatever risks that might entail. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the desire to do it came first and then the research followed. And I did, I mean... I read a bunch of stuff <laughs> um, uh, about Iraq, Iraqi culture. Uh, I watched some movies and documentaries. There's, um, you know, Iraqi cinema is not such great shakes, but there's a lot of great Iranian cinema that can help you get an insight into um, sort of similar Shia culture um, and different aspects. Uh, you know, um, I relied a lot especially, you know, in early days on uh, a book called The Baghdad Blog, which is by Salam Pax. He was a gay Iraqi computer programmer who blogged all through the invasion. Um, really interesting perspective, um, not one you would expect to see. Um, there, was some, there were some great documentaries uh, sort of in that period. There's Dreams of Sparrows, uh, and Hadar, Hey Hader, da I don't remember his last name. Dreams of Sparrows, you can look it up. Um, and then more, like, and then I reached out to Iraqi Americans and talked to them, and I, you know, like, tried some Iraqi cooking, and um, there's a great cookbook you can get. I'll, uh, you know, remind me and I'll tell you the name of it later. Um, and, and then in 2014, as a sort of like final draft of, final pass on, um, on detail, I went back to Baghdad for Rolling Stone. I reported on um, just what the city was like and what it was like to be a veteran back there. Um, and talked, you know, I spent, it was only two weeks I spent there. Uh, I talked to a lot of people uh, and saw, had a completely different experience of the city, obviously and of the people and what it was like there. Um, and that, being able to do that sort of allowed me another layer of, of revision and, and imagining um, and detail. Um, so it was a long process of like just trying to learn more, you know, and, and more and more. Um, I tried to learn some Arabic, but it was really hard. And I was working on a PhD in something completely different, so I had to like, focus. Uh, yeah, so that was some of what I did. I can, there's some, um, 
you know, there's names in the back of the book and the acknowledgments, and I can, I don't know, suggest titles to you uh, later. I'm very bad at remembering titles when I'm on the spot like this. But, yeah. Does that answer your question, or did you want more? The gender piece. The gender piece. You know, there's, uh, there's actually two books by a woman named Riverbend, a female Iraqi who blogged. Um, there have been, there's, you know, um, there's uh, Duny McHale, who's an Iraqi-American poet, female. Um, there's been another book, a uh, more recent book, that didn't actually wind up in the research, but, um, you know, research where I can, and and also just try to imagine, uh, and, you know, I talked to a lot of females, female Iraqis when I was there uh, in 2014, uh, purely university professors and, and uh, activists and, and some other people, yeah. Did you have much contact with Rebecca Lock when you were in Florida? No. Uh, aside from, what's that? Any at all other than people who worked with her? So. Uh, aside from running them off the road um, and stopping them at a traffic control point to search their cars, not really. Yeah. Um, we knew the kid who sold the porno DVDs in the green zone. Um, we would sometimes stop when we were on uh, IED patrols, we'd sometimes stop at a bakery. Um, that was pretty much our only interactions with locals that weren't either interpreters, uh, Iraqi soldiers, police, or people who worked on the compound. As, as far as that goes, actually, when, when, when I was in uh, Falcon on the sort of south side of Baghdad, um, we had a bunch of Iraqis working on the compound there. And so, um, you know, there was like a, a coffee shop. We would go there and sit in a coffee shop and talk to them. That guy brought his daughters. And, and uh, we watch, you know, um, like middle era of MTV and, and stuff. So there was some more contact there that was created by that kind of working relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, throughout the book, uh, you separate the stories with the uh, red model. But I was wondering what you were trying to uh, convey with that. Yeah. So. The, what I was trying to convey with those sections, the Babylon sections, was something like the collective unconscious of the global war on terror. Um, my friend, the poet Phil Philometris, was talking about it, and and he said it's you know it's like you wrote the Matrix, um, maybe. Um, but really, what I was trying to do was. Uh, something like what John Dos Passos did with the newsreel sections in the USA trilogy, or something like what William S. Burroughs was doing with his cut-up techniques, where there's this like collage of language that conveys something, you know, uh, something deeper than, you know, the, the semantic content of the language itself, right? Something about, um, the atmosphere of the language, or something about the environment of the language. I was just trying to like pipe that in, right? It's, I think of it as the, um, you know, like the, the, the tissue connecting these different sections. We're coming up on a, I mean, you know, you've had, you've had, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> this is actually for both of you guys, and it just picks up on something you were saying kind of about not being part of the because you're in the military. And I think my, my father was in Vietnam. And as a result, I started reading a lot of you know war books starting with Michael Hare and Tim O'Brien and that kind of thing. And then, like you said, Iraq happened, or you know, obviously <laughs> the Gulf War happened, then Iraq happened. And there was a little bit more of a lag almost, or it seems like it, like you're kind of saying. And how do you guys, or what do you think of the difference between the literature coming out of Vietnam versus Iraq you know, because we had, that war it was a draft. This war is a professional army. I was just curious what both of you guys, you guys had thoughts on that. You know, I, I, I kind of think that um, it's weird how similar they seem to be in, in a lot of ways. Um, one of my favorite Vietnam pieces, a novel called by Carl Malate, is called Matterhorn. What, seven years ago, something like that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's recent. It was like, yeah. 
<laughs> and Tim O'Brien's step was in the eighties, right? He his memoir came out in like seventy nine. No, earlier than that. Oh, really? His memoir came out in like seventy five oh. or something. Are you talking about the things, things they carried? That's different. Yeah, no, the, yeah. the things they carried is ninety ninety three. Yeah. But his memoir it was like in the early seventies. Then going after Cacciato, right. I think was seventy nine. Philip Caputo stuff was late. Yeah, so yeah. But there's like a whole still... bunch of stuff that people don't think about. There's uh, the short timers. There's uh, which was adapted into Full Metal Jacket. Gus Hasford's the short timers. There was um, Larry Heineman's um, Paco story. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of, you know the best one I, I thought I, I think I've read. I, I got this one book in like. The, it was like the Payless Drugstore in Lake Forest Park or something. And I'm like sitting around, it's like my mom's like shopping for cotton balls or something, and it's just taking forever. And so I'm like going through the books. And there's a book, there's like a, there's some kind of like dime store paperback, and it's called um, uh, Once a Warrior King, you know. It's like one of yeah. these like freaking hard boiled, you know, ragtag bunch of misfits or whatever. <laughs> um, but I got it, you know, and it turned out it was this guy that um, had. He had been like a about to go into grad school for like organic chemistry or something. Yeah. And he gets he like goes, but he but he's in ROTC or whatever, and he becomes an infantry officer, goes to ranger school, gets sent to Vietnam, and immediately becomes gets put in this program where he's like the. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, <laughs> where he's like the he's this. He's like the the American military advisor to this giant tribe of like Montagnard like. You like hill people, right. and there's like 800 freaking off, like kind of tough like hill warriors, and he's like the American guy that provides them with like some air support and stuff, and kind of leads this whole crazy tribe for for no other reason than that like America has a ton of money, right? And like we're over there basically, and this guy's like really trained up, and so he spends his year doing this crazy stuff in the jungle, like getting all these crazy firefights. When the year is up. Like, they get this telegram or phone call or something while this guy's out in some patrol and some fire, firefight. He comes back to his hooch, and his stuff is all packed because the, the, the helicopter's, like, arriving, like, in a half hour. And he get, and that ride, the helicopter gets there, he jumps on, and he's, like, in San Francisco, like, six hours later. So he's yeah. in six hours, like, 12 hours later. It's still right. crazy. Sorry for telling you that story. I think it's awesome. Once a Warrior King, the point is, there's, there's going to be a ton of, like, Iraq and Afghanistan books that no yeah. one, like, really, right. that are sell even more poorly than my book, believe it or not. Like, and it's going to be... Or mine. I feel like it's, like, going to be kind of similar in a weird way. So I answer yeah. your question with my answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and I would add, I, well, I guess, you know, the one thing, I guess two things I would say. One is that I do think, I think the Vietnam era stuff was a little bit, was more influenced by, like, Either psychedelica, like psychedelic yeah, culture yeah. and surrealism, right? Then our our generation stuff, um, which is a little bit more straightforward generally, um, and I, you know, I I suspect the draft volunteer thing has an effect, but I, I'm not gonna. Well, for one thing, we can't say that like we. Got drafted, right? We all volunteered. We all volunteered, right? We yeah. volunteered for that. Which, by the way, that was going to be a question I was going to ask you. I don't think we have time. Um, but the other difference is here. I, I'm going to go ahead and like go on a limb here with another difference. All right, <laughs> check it out. As far as I know, um, with the Vietnam books I've written by veterans, it's never really been a book like Roy's book that is like, hey, you know what? It was kind of bad actually, and, and we actually did some bad things. Maybe you should know about that because it seems to me that. In the, with the Vietnam generation, it was very much like held up as like, hey, this, there's some bad stuff going on, and veterans are maybe not somebody to be praised, right? Um, I wasn't around, but that was that's my sense of the, the environment and the times. Whereas it seems to me the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans had this sort of welcoming that was almost like a reaction to that. Like the American public was like, oh, we shouldn't have been like mean yeah. like that, uh, and now we're going to be really nice, and like we're going to like say thank you for your service in airports and stuff like that, which they did. I think there was a change, by the way, between like from 2003, 2005, it wasn't so much, and then after that, like I got a lot of thank yous. Yeah. Um, but because of that, in Vietnam, there, there was never like a book that that with an author saying like, hey, stop thanking us for our service and let's talk about the bad things. That's Roy's book, I think. Right. With, with, with this. Yeah. With this no, that's that's true. Uh, you know, but there's and there's another difference is that in that is that like, I think it's much harder for us to, uh, and I, I don't 
I don't think it's convincing for writers of Iraq and Af Afghanistan to portray the soldiers as victims of the of the circumstances. Although, you know, I think I'm not going to name names. There was an early novel that did that, that tried to do that very strongly. Um, but um, yeah, so. No, it's not mine. It's not, but mine. It's not yours. Uh, no, no, no. It's, I mean, the yellow birds. It's yeah, like, okay, right, 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 right. It's like whatever. So yeah, you here. Yeah. So and then, yeah, because the, th the thing I'm kind of really responding to tonight is being of the Vietnam generation and being involved in all that. Thank and you for your service. <laughs> and then uh, you know, the cultural differences around that war for our generation and this war for your and younger generations. I'm uh, curious about them. Cultural differences, and also this war is still going on. Yes, but I don't know that in this country. Uh, I mean, the thing I'm realizing tonight, listening to you read, is just making me think about kind of how, just as a person, I did process Vietnam and all the stuff around that mm -hmm. and the politics. But I'm not sure I'm processing the Iraq War, which is still going on, quite the same way, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> Because yeah. we're still over there fighting this stuff and sending people and deploying people for the fourth and fifth and whatever time. I, I don't know. I mean, how yeah. do you guys see that? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's another. I mean, and this is going out into to a bit more, uh, you know, sort of broader speculation and talking more historically. I think there's a big, there's a big way in which you know the Vietnam the Vietnam War, not even just the writing, but the Vietnam War is about World War II in a certain way, right? It's about this sort of this movement of America into uh, world leadership and and the Cold War, the conflict between freedom and and communism, and part of I think looking historically what the what the the moral problem of the Vietnam War was that it couldn't live up to World War II in a certain way, right? Like, it, World War II became the good war, whatever problems might have been involved with, you know, with that, and, and, and Vietnam couldn't live up to that. I think there's a generational thing going on there, and there's a lot of stuff going on there, and has, you know, a lot of, whatever, complicated, huge swaths of, of history. I'm, I'm painting now. And Iraq is different. The global war on terror is different in a, in, a, in a ton of ways. One one way being that I think for a lot of Americans, whatever whatever was done to Arab people, brown people in the Middle East after 9/11 was justified, right? In, in a sort of retaliation logic. I think another thing is that, as you're pointing out, like it's the the, the there's not a sense that the war is being fought by the American people. It's being fought by like a, a technical, professional group of, you know, contractors and and hired killers, right? And like they're and they're they're supposed to be professional and and elite. But it's you know you watch something like Zero Dark Thirty, right? This popular representation of the contemporary American military. It's it's a very elite hunter-killer team, they're sort of RoboCop, you know, they have all this machinery on. It's a completely different conception for the popular imagination than the, like, the World War II platoon movie, right? Where it's like, there's the Italian guy, and there's the Jewish guy, and there's the, you know, there's the guy from Oklahoma, and, like, it's like the army is a melting pot, right? It's a very different perception in the cultural imaginary of what, of what the military is for. It's not a melting pot anymore. It's not a melting pot. No, it's like, you know. Not at all. I mean, it's not. It's, it's more of a melting pot than, uh, oh, it is, than for it, instance, it is colleges. It is a reality, you know? But yeah, it's not like. Best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd say, well, so, so for both of us, right, and I think you just said this a little earlier, yeah. we're kind of both the only people that we know from our civilian friend crew that uh, are veterans, right? That are veterans yes. of the Iraq and Afghanistan where you know anybody else that you met not through either the Army or the veteran writing program, right? Yeah. You mean after no. you went or before you went? After you went. After you came home. No. You mean so? I mean either uh, either way. Uh, yeah, both. I don't think I have any like 
elementary school friends that yeah. are also veterans or anything like that. And you didn't yeah. make any friends. I had family. In the Army that you kept after you got out. Well, so, I mean, sure, but that's yeah, not the point. The point is that, like, we live in these in this social world, right? Right. Yeah. Where, like, our social world just doesn't have veterans in it. Got it. Right? Yeah. We're the only ones. Um, and that's interesting, and that wasn't the case in in World War II or Korea, but also not in Vietnam so much as much. Yeah, I mean World War II was like sixteen million men in uniform. Yeah, sixteen I mean, million men totally in uniform. Yeah, that's a completely different situation. Yeah, uh, yep. uh, who's just behind you, sir? Oh, in the green jacket. Sorry. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, given what you're just talking about, well, how then did you both come to volunteer? Uh, given that it was such an anomaly within your group of peers, um, and how do you feel about that decision now? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I have an excuse. I, I volunteered in '99, all right. I mean, right. no one, nothing's going on. Um, I was, I volunteered for the National Guard because I thought it would expand my horizons. I could give back to society, make a little college money. I never really thought I was going to do much with it. Um, but you know, and it was also just because I, because I kind of knew that like nobody else. I was like some kind of, I was like, let's say I played bass and like read books and stuff. I, you know, I wasn't a hippie, but, eh, you know, like, so it was just to expand my horizon, sort of. Uh, the short version is that I come from a military family, so it made sense in a certain way, um, and I did it for the college money. The more complicated version um, is that, you know, I... A first generation college student dropped out, spent a bunch of years like working in food service, um, wound up after 9 11 living in, in my mom's. I was 25 years old living in my mom's basement with messed up teeth from a bike accident that I couldn't afford to get fixed. And I'd been trying to be a writer for years and had you no know, success with it. Um, and so I'm like, well, I need to do something. You know, I want to go to war and see what that's like. And get my teeth fixed and get the college money and maybe there's something to write about there. So, and, and also, you know, there's another reason too, which is that like, I was, uh, you know, I was for many years, uh, you know, when I was working in food service, whenever I was a pretty, pretty lefty kind of activist. I, I worked for the Sierra club for a while, went door to door, worked for Washburg. Uh, and, after 9-11, it wasn't that, like, I, I, it actually, after I was, I was here for the WTO protests in, um, 99, which I found very dispiriting, uh, very demoralizing, and sort of, you know, kind of made me question the efficacy of that kind of, that kind of thing, a questioning which has stayed with me <laughs> for, for a while now. But, um, but then after 9-11, it wasn't that I thought, well, oh, you know, Western civilization is under attack, we should defend it. Um, but suddenly, the kinds of things I was hearing from the people I'd been listening to, like Noam Chomsky and, and Susan Sontag, just didn't, they weren't quite as convincing anymore. Um, you know, I, I, maybe, you know, American imperialism was better than Islamic fundamentalism, if that was the choice, you know? And, and I don't, I just wanted to understand it better. I wanted to see what, what American empire looked like, out where it got made, out where it was done, where, you know, uh, George Orwell called it the dirty work of empire, where that got done. And so that was another motivation behind joining the, the military. You know, I mean, it's a big thing. You don't, you don't do something like that for one reason, you do it for like 20. Can I also say though, like since you're here, I'm gonna go ahead and go on the limb and say you're probably a big reader, right? And uh, did you grow up in, here? No, I'm Canadian. Okay. Yeah. But th when you grew up, you, I bet you read a lot of books and they were like set in New York City though, right? I did. Maybe not. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I just feel like, re I read a lot of books when I was a kid. I wasn't from New York City. And I was like, I kinda wanna go to New York. You know, all these books are set in New York. And I think war books are like that. There's a lot of war books, oh, yeah. right? And it's, you just kind of read it, and it's like, yeah, it's, it sounds like it's terrible. I kind of want to check it out, you yeah. know, like, it, which is the same with a lot of New yeah. York City books, which, by the way, we're totally perpetuating this right now, dude. You know, just let yeah. you know, like, uh, that's part of it. <laughs> but either yeah. you did say how you feel about it now. Oh. 
Um, well, it worked. I went to college. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I had a pretty easy tour, all things considered. Like, I didn't have to kill anybody. I didn't see anybody get killed. Like, my unit, like, you know, we had our share of bad days, but nothing crazy, nothing really bad. And, and we got through it, and I was lucky. And I feel, you know, I was talking with Gavin about this earlier. Like, I, I don't feel personally guilty for anything I did. Like, most of the missions we did was IED, IED patrols and, like, picking up unexploded ordnance. Like, that's great, picking up unexploded ordnance. Kids don't blow themselves up. Yes. At the same time, especially after going back to Baghdad in 2014, like, I feel like I was part of a giant hustle. Like, I was part of this really grotesque scam, right, that killed a bunch of people for no good reason. And that I don't feel good about. I feel ashamed about that. But it's, it's strange. And, and part of it also has to do with like how we valorize, again, back to this question of the American soldier, how we valorize the American soldier here and, and, and how that sits in American culture. So uh, it's complicated would be the short answer. Um, yeah. I think I think I feel good about it. I think I think I think I did a good job and did a hard job with as much respect and respect for the dignity of like Iraqis, you know, as I as I reasonably could have. And I feel good about that. At the same time, I think it made, it's made my life harder. Um, I mean, my life would probably be, have been more fun and easy had I not gone. Um, and yet, I've learned a lot of stuff. I wouldn't if I had to go back and like pick different things for my life. Wait, not do it again. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, I wanted to follow up on that because, see, in my generation, I was lucky I didn't get drafted. Yeah. But uh, you know, we knew that we were screwed, right? Especially by the end of the war, everybody was against the war. There was a rebellion. That's probably what stopped the war. But uh, I was taping another event where. Um, Somebody was talking up, there were, as a sergeant was talking to his men, and he said, you know, well, you know, Saddam didn't have anything to do with the weapons of mass destruction, and, and he didn't have anything to do with 9-11. We've been snookered, you know, but we just want to try to survive this. So, like, what was your sense when you were there, you guys? How... Uh, were you affected by this kind of unawareness, or were the other soldiers aware of this, or what? Uh, that the war was like fought on a pretext of lies? That basically they got scammed and they were stuck there. I mean, we joked a lot about the WMDs, like, because we, it's partly because we had to carry around these gas masks for the first several weeks and like thought they were useless um, although you know I mean there was also like there was fear at the very beginning like oh maybe we're gonna get gas um, I don't know I mean at least in my experience and among the you know enlisted soldiers are sort of like they sort of affect a very cynical attitude that is at the same time a very earnest attitude. Like, yeah, they're gonna lie to you. You can't trust the government. You can't trust your officers. You can't trust your generals. But we're gonna do our job and we're gonna take care of each other and that's what we do because we're soldiers, right? They send us, they're gonna send us to do the shittiest, stupidest thing that is dumb and there's no reason why anyone should do it and we're just gonna go do it because that's who we are. Right, and so I think that was that was my experience of the attitude, and so you know things like, and, and that's also you know that's inflected with varying degrees of like genuine patriotism or you know other kinds of of disaffection, soldier to soldier it depends. Um, so uh, yeah, on the one hand, it's hard to make generalizations. On the other hand, like it surprised, I don't think it surprised anyone that I was serving with that like. Oh yeah, the the government lied to us. Yeah, that's what they do. Like we just go do our job. 
Yeah, my, my take was that, well, people didn't talk probably as freely to me because I was a platoon leader and I was a lieutenant. Yeah. Um, I actually didn't really have friends necessarily because I was like the I was the officer and I was just me the officer and like all my guys. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have well, a buddy. You know, pity the floor LT. I know. Well, it's <laughs> tough, man. Um, but. My my take was that like no one just knew what was going on. You no, know? but yeah. nobody knew what was going on. Uh, the Bush administration didn't know what was going on. They failed the plan. They just screwed the pooch in so many ways. Um, and and I think that like for sure, like that was definitely like the platoon. My platoon felt that yeah. was true. Like whether or not they also thought that they were like lied to intentionally, um, I don't know. I think some did and most didn't. Is my sense. Yeah. But everyone definitely had the sense that no one knows what the hell is going on. Right. Especially because like I mean I my job was doing perimeter security for the green zone in the early days of the occupation, which meant that we were trying to figure out who got to go into the green zone and who got to, had to keep out, yeah. who was blowing the bombs up, which we had no idea. Like, yeah. like we just, I mean, there was just bodies showing up, like, in the river. We just dragged bodies out of the river. Like, who's this guy? Who killed him? I don't know. Nobody knows. We, we had no intel. Um, right. And, like, you can, I, I almost felt like a kind of um, sympathy for, like, the Bush administration and the CIA at the time, like, of 9-11, directly afterwards, and, like, there's always going to be some kind of, like, threat, credible or not, and you can't respond to them all, so people just start running around in circles, and we were definitely running around in circles. Yeah, no, I think I would correct what I said, that, and, and I agree with, with Gavin that I think most soldiers would, would, would be more likely to attribute incompetence to the leadership than, than outright deceit, although, you know, I think outright to see it isn't probably not, you know, wouldn't be beyond the can, right? It wouldn't be unimaginable. Yeah? Um, so I want to go back a little bit. Uh, you guys mentioned that in World War II, uh, it was a melting pot, and I just watched Fury and Saving Private Ryan recently, and then it changed and it's not a melting pot. What do you mean by that? Right, so that's a great question for a couple of reasons. So I was sort of, um, I was referring to the way that we represented World War II, and I'm, I was actually referring more toward to older movies, um, sort of the precursors to Saving Private Ryan and Fury. Um, but even 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 those movies and Band of Brothers still uh, sort of invoke that tradition where like. And it's it's a it's a white melting pot. Don't get me wrong, but it's a it's a mix of white ethnicities that was sort of portrayed very often in during World War II and after as being like this is how America has came together. Well, and class too. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, like a melting pot. Of yeah, so and, and class. class too, yeah. right? So there's like there's always like um, uh, a snooty guy from Princeton. There's like an Italian guy from the Bronx, right? <laughs> there's a Jewish guy, there's like sometimes a Latino guy, um, less often, but sometimes. Um, you know, and it's sort of, um, there's, uh, you know, an Irish guy, and then there's like, you know, the, the, the dumb guy from Oklahoma or whatever. Um, and, and like, this is a way of representing um, in, in movies, right? Like the American collective and, the, and that World War II was this time when we all came together. And then, you know, and sometimes uh, in like Sam Fuller's The Steel Helmet, like you would start to get, uh, which is actually about Korea, uh, African American soldiers would, would start to appear in this melting pot uh, as, as it went on from Korea. But that, that was actually only very brief because then Vietnam made everything complicated again. Um, and I don't think we see that same kind of representation in popular conceptions of Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Um, you did in Generation Kill, but you don't in Zero Dark Thirty, right? In Zero Dark Thirty, or um, that movie about the EOD guy. You're kind of talking about ethnicity right now. I'm talking about ethnicity yeah. and and class. Like, the, the focus um, on the, like, multicultural makeup of the platoon, if it's there, it's not emphasized. It's just accepted as normal, but it's not the primary aspect of, it's not the, it's not the focus of the representations of soldiers today, which are, I, I would argue, is that they're like, 
techno, technologically enhanced professions, right? But I mean, for one thing, white is just white nowadays. Like, no one cares if you're Italian or Jewish. Yeah, that right. Much, you know what I mean? Right. The other thing is, Zero Dark Thirty, those elite units, pretty freaking white. Yeah. Uh, they actually, the very elite units are very white. Yeah. Um, which are, by the way, the ones that also take the heaviest combat losses because they're in combat so much. But they all right. also all the the are the elite units. Um, but I mean, the, the social class thing to me seems to be like a, a a relic of the Vietnam cultural crisis, where in World War One, like there were so many children of privilege going into battle and getting killed that that was one of the impetus of the draft. That's my understanding. Is that they were like, were our ruling class is being killed. Certainly, that happened in Britain, right? Yeah. Like the, you know, these, these young officers were just getting slaughtered, and they had like a whole lost generation of of aristocratic Britons, and that was true also in the U.S. Um, in, in World War II, was, there was such a mass mobilization, it wasn't yeah. quite like that. But in Vietnam, then you started having a the cultural clash, where, where, where children that don't that can get out of it do get out of it. Yeah. And then these deferments, which to right. me seem crazy that they had these deferments. You know, if you're, it seems to me if you're going to like send people to war, like don't let them not go if they're rich or go to a good college. I mean, it seems crazy to me now. Right. Um, but I think that's kind of part of it. And and. And over the years, since then, for sure, like we have this cultural thing where the the children of like wealthy people, people with good educations, won't even consider going there, and certainly their parents don't want them there, right? I mean, is that that's yeah. a thing, right? Yeah, uh, I was uh, talking with with uh, literary historian Richard Sockin, and he he made a really interesting point um, about he. For him, he thinks uh, through and after Vietnam, that sort of multicultural platoon story shifted from the war story to being uh, to going into science fiction, in movies like Aliens, um, and um, and I would I would argue now that it's gone into the superhero film. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, whereas the war story became more about elite teams through um, movies like Navy SEALs um, and uh, stuff like that because it, it sort of the, the locus of the war film started to shift into the Middle East and be about these elite units doing like targeted missions. Um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a complicated argument, a complicated discussion. I hope I answered some of your questions. Oh, is that good? Is that good? Good. All right. Thank you all for your great time. And thanks to Gavin and thanks to uh, Elliot Beck.